Ooh. Hello, everybody. My name is Dewana Whitted. Good evening, Jerusalem Missionary Church. Um, my name again is Dewana Whitted, and I'm just sitting in tonight for um, Pastor Jackson and going to get ready to go ahead and start the Bible study. And the title of this Bible study is The Power and Privilege of Prayer. The Power and Privilege of Prayer. So whenever you come in, feel free to like let me know you're here. And I'm going to go ahead and get started. The first thought whenever I was asked by Pastor Jackson to teach the Bible study for the purpose and power of prayer, a thought came to my mind. And um, it's, it's something that you probably have heard people say before. Um, it's, it's a common uh, response to some sometimes calamity or a family emergency or it's a common response to um, when somebody finds out something went wrong a lot of people say this phrase the phrase is this well you can't do nothing but pray right all we can do is pray and every time i hear those words i tend to cringe because in reality, the best thing we could do is pray. But yet still, there's people who lean towards all that I can do is pray. So with that, again, as I was studying for the principle and power of prayer, I wanted to find out what did power look like? What did privilege look like? Um, so that I could give you a clear understanding of how God feels when we pray. So the first thing I'm going to go to is I'm going to give you a couple of definitions. Definition one is, I'm going to start with power. Meaning the definition for power from the, from the Webster's Dictionary is the ability to do something or act in part. But then there was another scripture that, I'm not scripture, there was another definition that I felt like I should use in tandem with that, that it just, I read it. It says the supply mechanical or electrical energy too. So that scripture just, I'm not, I don't know why I can't want to call it scripture, but that particular definition stood out to me. That is the supply or mechanical, the supply of mechanical or electrical energy. I'm going to come back to that. Then I looked up what the word privilege meant and the definition for privilege. I came out of um, come more like out of the Bible. It says, hold on, let me see. I might have put it in a different place. And I did. So sorry. Hold on. So the privilege is 
it's like a a reward. It, I, I can't find my definition, so I'm gonna use this scripture because I gotta keep. I mean, I do. I don't know why I'm gonna keep saying I'm using scripture, but I'm gonna use this um, example, and you probably can understand where I'm coming from because I don't know why I just don't see where I wrote it at. But anyway, privilege. I used to hear this a lot when I was little. It is a privilege to ride the school bus. It's a privilege. Like they don't owe you to ride no school bus. It's your privilege. So as I looked up privilege and I started pondering on power and privilege, I thought about this scripture over in Isaiah. And I'm going to go to Isaiah um, 53 and it's verse... I'm going to just do verse five for this one. And it goes this way. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we were healed. Now, mind you, this is a scripture that we have heard, right? Like it's been versed in our ears. We've heard it in many sermons, women's conferences, men conferences. When people are praying, we constantly use that particular scripture. But here lately, even way prior to me he hearing that um, I would stand in her stead to teach this Bible study, this scripture has been like, I don't know a better way to say it, but messing with me, right? Like I I could be asleep or I could be woke and all of a sudden I could be driving down, dri driving down the road and this scripture, whether I'm asleep, woke, driving down the road, walking, it would just come to me, but he was wounded. But I'm going to tell you why. Because for years in prayer, I would just say something like, if I was praying for someone who was sick, I would say, excuse me, for I had to take a drink of water. But if I was praying for someone who was sick, I would say this scripture. I would stand on this scripture. But he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquities. And the chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we're healed. But it was until I kept feeling that scripture mess with me that I dug a little deeper, right? And so I want to dig a little deeper. And I want to share... A, a verse I don't think I um, put in my notes, but it is um, Isaiah 52. And then this verse is 14. And it says, as many were, as, were astonished at him at thee, is what it says. His visage was mar was so marred more than any man and his form than the sons of men. So I'm going to say it again. And his as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Now I want to go to 53 and 5. I'm going to read 52 and 14 one more time, but I'm going to act like the next scripture is 53 and 5. Okay. So as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man in his form more than the sons of them I mean, the sons of men but but he was wounded for our transgression he was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was upon him what i'm trying to get you to understand is this scripture is telling us like don't just look at it like okay he was wounded for like the world like make it personal like when you think about him being his visage was so marred more than any man. The Bible talks of him being beat with the cat of nine tails. The Bible talks of, of him bearing so many stripes. The Bible talks of him having the corn, the throne, <laughs> the crown of thorns placed upon his head and mashed in and blood shrinkled down his face. The Bible talks of him being pierced in his sides. The Bible talks of him being nailed with nails in the wrist of his hand as his feet was crossed a nail was slammed in the middle of his feet to hold his feet to the cross like now when you hear this scripture but he was wounded like and you you see all of the magnitude of the things that he had to go through for you for me so now when we say this scripture we say he was wounded watch jesus every time that i have lied every time that i have sinned every time that i've been every, as I was separated from the love of God, he was wounded for me to be back in relationship with him. Let me try to He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of my peace was upon him. So when I look at the scripture in light of prayer, that's our privilege. He didn't have to do it, but he did. He didn't have to stand on that stand he didn't have to stand there be ridiculed 
in front of so many people, people that he had fed, people that he had healed, people that he had made sure he opened the word for them to gain understanding. He was wounded for our transgressions. We was right iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, now we can come boldly before the throne. But it is not like God owes us this. It's a privilege to pray. Okay, let me go a little further. I'm going to go to Genesis 2 and 7 first. I hope I can pull this picture together for you all clearly. I'm going to try my best. Genesis 2 and 7 reads, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Again, God is doing all this not because he has to, because he wants to, right? But I want to I want to read something into your hearing tonight that like like broke this up for me, like it just really blew it out of the water. So when I read the scripture that we was created from the dust of the earth, I, I started to ask myself, because I'm kind of creative and I like to do certain things with my hands. I I, I started to ask myself, like in the in, in the natural, right? What can we use dust for? Like, because most of us don't even like dust to kind of come in our houses. Like we're cleaning and dusting. Like Saturday is a ritual for a lot of people to take the curtains down, to wipe the walls because there's a buildup of dust. And, and to a lot, they, they are allergic to the dust that builds up in the home. So we make sure that we do everything we can do to get it out versus leaving dust. And so when I thought about that, we was made from the dust of the earth. I started to ask myself, like, what, what can we do with this? Like, I know what you can do with sand and I know what you can do with mud, but dust. Right. And so I, I stumbled across this passage that is written by Alfred Russell Wallace. It was written back in 1898, and he said something about dust that just was interesting to me, and I'll read it to you. It says, the majority of persons, if asked what they were, if asked what were the uses of dust, would reply that they did not know it had any. Excuse me. They did not know it had any, but they were sure it was a great nuisance. So I'm going to read it again. The majority of persons, if asked what were the uses of this, would reply that they did not know it had any, but they were sure it was a great nuisance. The title of his, his writing was called The Importance of This, A Source of Beauty and Essential to Life. Again, I said when the house starts getting dusty, none of us tend to think it is a source of beauty or it's essential to life. Now, I can't go and break down his whole um, thought on in that particular writing that he wrote. But again, if you want to look it up, it's called The Importance of Dust, A Source of Beauty and Essential to, and essential to Life. And it was written in 1898. But then I, even though I cannot expound on all of it there was so much of it was that was just powerful to me as i was reading his writing here i look at god created man from what man looks at as useless he created man from the dust of the earth right you're like the one where you going with this how does this have anything to do with the power and privilege to pray so as I'm looking at this, like these thoughts are like coming to my mind. And so I just stop and look them up. And so it says, that this, uh, I wrote in my notes that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And I thought that was kind of interesting that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And you might be wondering, well, why did you really think that's interesting? Because the disciples in were, were asking Jesus to do something he had already done, like roll with me if you will so i'm gonna go over to matthew and i'm looking at um, matthew the sixth chapter and i'm looking at verses six through ten if you read verses six through six through ten you will see that the disciples here are saying but thou when thou the disciples are asking jesus to teach and pray and he says no, no no i apologize i apologize here jesus gives them what they need versus them asking it's over in a later chapter that they ask for them to him to teach them to pray. So here 
Jesus is saying, I know something that you're going to need per adventure, so I'm going to go ahead and make sure that you have it. So here he says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door um, to thy father, when I had shut the door, pray in, to thy father in secret. And I'm going to try to do this better with my glasses on. <laughs> in secret. And the father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when thou pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our father, I, I want to make, Certain, put emphasis on certain words. So I say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, in, I need you to clearly understand that, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. In that passage, it is clear that God is saying he wants his will done in earth as it is in heaven. Y'all y'all would agree. Y'all with me there. But if you think about it, think about every time that you've ever stood at in church services um, at the benediction and they say the Our Father prayer or you're getting ready, you're at a funeral and they, they're getting ready to put the body into the, to the ground and they say the Our Father prayer. And in unison, we all go Our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Did you hear what I said? On earth as it is in heaven. Dewana, where are you going? The scripture says in earth, right? So time is rolling on. The disciples are walking with Jesus. Jesus has called certain ones of them away. Um, he calls 12 disciples and he begins to teach them the ways of the kingdom. What I thought was interesting is that prior to him teaching them the ways of the kingdom. He gives them the power at a certain point and he tells them to go out two by two. I'm not going to name all these scriptures because it'll be really lengthy if I do. But he calls them two by two and he sends them out and he tells them like, go heal the sick, lay your hands on the sick that they should recover. So he said, if they receive, if they don't receive you, dust your feet. Like he sent them out. And so the disciples come back like kids in the candy store. And it's like, to me, it reminds me of my grandkids. Like whenever they come back, they all come back with stuff they got. They'd be like, oh, granny, I got, I needed water. Oh, granny, I got McDonald's. Or, oh, granny, I got a SpongeBob toy. Or, oh, granny, I got this and I got that. They're so excited. And sometimes their mama has to go, slow down, slow down, slow down. Let's talk about what really was important that we got. So whenever they came back to the to Jesus, they was like, Jesus, like, look, we was able to do this, we was able to do that, we was able to lie. We was able to cast out devils. And Jesus pauses them for a minute. And he tells them, like, I saw Satan fall from the sky as a star, right? But he also, he doesn't stop there. Something else that he says to them that is like very important for us to remember. He says like, don't get excited that you were able to cast out devils. I need what you to get excited about is that your name is written in the land of life. And I'm like, okay. Like, woo, okay. But then you go and you, I think it's in uh, Luke, Luke 9, 27 through 28. And here you have Jesus is going up. And I want to make sure I'm right on this. So let me turn to Luke. Luke 9, because sometimes in my excitement, so y'all please pray for me, because while I'm excited, sometimes I can get off a little bit, and I don't want to get off. So Luke 9, here you have Jesus is getting ready to go up to the trans transfiguration, right? And he takes up three to go with him. He takes three of them to go with him, and something happens. I don't know whether, let me say it like this. Something happened. There's one scripture that you read and, the, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have their different accounts of what happened. It's like all of us in the same place and want to say, well, this happened. Another said this happened. And by the time we get to the last one, the whole message has changed, right? Well, so you have these disciples that are walking with him and you have one that says that the disciples went up with him and Jesus says they were here and pray. And then when Jesus come back, they're, no, they're not praying. And whenever Jesus goes back up and come back, they're still not praying. Like Jesus asked them, like, look, couldn't y'all just pray one hour? And they were, they were asleep, right? So now you have here Luke telling the account of Jesus is going up to his transfiguration and three of the disciples have come. But what interesting happens for me is that whenever Jesus is there, literally he's transfigured. Like his body is changed. His The Bible says, 
as I looked up certain words, it says his, his garment was glistening, shinier and whiter than any full of soap could have done, right? And the, the disciples in their excitement, it was like, hey, Jesus, like, look, let's make you, we need to make all three of y'all a house because now they're not just seeing Jesus, they're seeing Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And they're Elijah. So they're saying, like, this is what we need to do. And now all of a sudden, this cloud comes, and then God has to tell them, like, look, this is my beloved son. Like, do what he tells you to do. Why do y'all think it's for y'all to tell him what to do? He tells y'all what to do. So listen to him. So I'm like, okay, like, Lord, okay, okay, okay. I see this. I see this. I know. I feel like I'm chopping all over the place. And you're like, do want to please get the power, privilege, a prayer. I promise you I'm getting there. As I'm looking at this, I started to go back into the Bible and look at different people's prayer that was powerful, right? And so I come to 1 Kings 18, um, 18 chapter 37 through 38 verse and it's Elijah he prays to God that he would prove that he's the real God here you got these prophets of Baal that think their God is the real God and so Elijah like like let's put him to the test and I'm at living a little bit because I know these are long scriptures but he's, he's like let's put him to the test like let me show you whose God is real like let's build an altar and let's set it on fire and let's see who God um, no, let's build an altar and let's pray to our gods to see whose God actually likes the altars on fire because whoever lights it on fire is the true is the real true and wise god elijah after so much time of them praying and that the bible taught like they was just like praying and and um, prophesying to the to the to the altar in nothing and elijah simply prays a prayer i gotta go to it y'all i'm so sorry um it's in kings 18 first kings 18 and 37 37 and 38 and he says hear me O lord hear me that this people may know that thou art the lord god and that thou hast turned their heart back again then the bible says the fire of the lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice in the wood and the stones and the y'all got to hear this i'm gonna i just got this one <laughs> Then the fire of the Lord can then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. He was created from the dust of the earth and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So Elijah proves it. El Elyon, Adonai, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is God, right? But look how what happened when he prayed versus when the prophets of Baal were praying to something that was not a real God. That was a powerful prayer. So here we also have in Samuel. Let me flip over to Samuel right quick. I'm going to try to get as much as I can in to paint this picture for you. Um, and I'm going in the wrong way. Samuel is back this way. There you go. First Samuel 1 and 10. And here we have the story of Hannah, she wanted a child and she'd been believing God for a child, but she had not had none. And every year she went up to the, um, to every year they went to worship and pay alms and things of that nature. She was going to, and every time she was always getting picked at by Penaya, like, uh, you ain't had no baby. Mm -mm -mm. I don't have about seven, eight. You still ain't had no, I, I mean, I had lived on the number a little bit, but she had more children and Hannah didn't have any. And so the Bible says that Hannah after she she decided that she wasn't going to eat that she was going to put she was going to give her offering but she's going to put herself in a place where she could just pray to the lord and the bible says that she did and it says here in 10 and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the lord and wept sore now i'm gonna cut that one short so for time but she was blessed with the child samuel who she gave back to god powerful prayer but i don't want to leave it there like i said i i, I looked at the power that comes within prayer and i realized that there was someone else that i i cannot leave out and i'm gonna go all the way to revelations here you have the book of revelations written by one of the disciples believed to be written by one of the disciples which is john who also was like um in the like in the beginning of the disciples when he chose john was one of the ones as i was studying this i realized that john worked um, they they say that John wrote most of the book of Revelations or the whole book of Revelations while exiled 
to this place called Platmus. Patmos. So here he is there and he's no longer allowed to be in other places. He's exiled. He's been put out. He's been put to the side. He's been pushed away. And while he's there, the Bible talks about him going into a trance. And I'm like, whoo, like, well, this prayer thing is a little bit more powerful than I think that we really, really understand that it is. But then if you look over in Acts, you have Brother, Brother Paul doing the same thing. The Bible says that he goes up on to the um, terrace and he's waiting for the food to get cooked downstairs. The Bible says he was hungry, but he was while he was waiting, he said he went up to the to the terrace. And while he's sitting on the terrace, the Bible says he went into a trance. He's, he's praying and goes into a trance. And when he goes into trance, he is now given information that there's another person somewhere that is praying who loves me, but God wants to give him the Holy Spirit. But he knows if he sends Paul, he's going to consider that person unclean. So God has to deal with the fact that Paul is going to think from that perspective because of all of the stuff that he's been trained over the years. So he has to deal with him that there's nothing unclean in God's sight. So God now is downloading information to Paul. I'm sitting here like, look, y'all, I'm like, this prayer thing is way more powerful than we really are giving it. I can't even say room for in our life, really. If we really gave it room prayer in our life, I wonder really what would transpire so as i kept looking at prayer i kept thinking this thing i was like lord what if when we pray it's not just supposed to have been about things like a house a car my bills getting paid my children taking care of them not that it's anything bad because the bible says whatever you decide when you pray believe you shall receive but what i've noticed is that is a lot like that's the plateau like people have gotten to those prayers and they don't go no further but the people of bible times whenever they pray they didn't you i don't see a whole lot of them praying for just things like a house a car a new job my purpose blah, blah, blah. what i see them praying for as they're praying the bible says when jesus was in the garden of gethsemane he prayed so hard that the 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 sweat that fell off his face was like blood so to me there was a difference in how they were praying then and how we pray now so when i was looking at it i started to notice something and whenever you look at Jesus, whenever Jesus is asked by the disciples to teach us to pray, I had a problem with the scriptures. I'm like, wait a minute. He already told them to pray. Why in the world would he, they now be saying Jesus teaches to pray? Here's the why. They were already, the disciples had already been given the power to cast out devils. They had already been given the power to heal, lay their hands on the sick. They had already been given those powers, right? But they're looking at this Jesus who not just has power to lay his hands on the sick and see them recover, but he has the power to raise up somebody from the dead. And it doesn't stop there. You got to think back on those scriptures in Matthew, Mark and Luke, every one of their account. They're talking about how Jesus comes walking on the water. The Bible that I read says that they were afraid. They were like, Whoa! like why are you afraid? And that's Jesus. Because you've been walking with Jesus all this time. How in, the, how in the world right now are you afraid? I don't understand. Well, when I look at it more, I realize that when they saw Jesus, they didn't just see Jesus, the man. They saw Jesus, the spirit. I'm not lying to you. When you read your scriptures, you're going to see that they said, oh, I thought it was a ghost ghost they was afraid because it looked like a spirit who get got to get away from here what i come to realize you might be like the where you're going i know i'm i'm trying to bring this thing home because i got like a little bit of time to bring this on <laughs> with that being said whenever they pray whenever Jesus prayed, whenever some of the disciples prayed, the experience that they experienced in prayer is a little different from what the experience we get now. That I see, um, I don't see it being a norm. So what happened whenever they prayed, it was like, there's a scripture in, the, in Romans that said, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? It's like whenever they prayed, it wasn't just a renewing of their mind. Remember, let me go back to, before I tell you the this one. Let me go back to um, Genesis for a minute. Not Genesis, Exodus. Moses here is bringing, um, he's been um, called up to the mountain to God, right? And as he calls up to the mountain to God, God gives him the Ten Commandments. Okay, so he comes down, they're cutting up, acting up, Moses breaks the Ten Commandments, and then he ends up going back, right? But when he went back and God rewrote those Ten, had, had um, Moses to write those Ten Commandments, what happens is as as Moses is getting closer and closer to God, Moses now realized like, oh, you know, I really want you. So Moses 
asked God this question. He said, can you show me your glory? And God says, well, like, look, nobody has seen my face and live. So I'll, I'll allow you to see my backside. Matter of fact, when I come past, I'm going to put my hand. Like, I don't even imagine that it was a hand that was just small enough just to cover his eyes. I imagine that when God put his hand, it was so big that it covered Moses' a whole entire being. Right. But when he went past Mo and God moved his hand, now Moses was able to see his backside. But what happened in that moment when Moses was able to see God? It was amazing. The Bible says that when he came back down, that the children was even afraid. They were like, oh, because his skin was so translucent. And I'm like, Dwayne, where are you going? When the disciples were supposed to have been praying for Jesus, eyes open and still praying, their eyes were shut because they were asleep and they didn't see that Jesus was transfiguring. They didn't know what was happening. So when they woke, it's almost like us. If we go to sleep, right? And all of a sudden somebody wake you up a deep sleep and all of a sudden the chaos going around, you, you're like, got to get your parents together. Like, wait, 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 huh? Wait, so you say, what? That's kind of where the disciples was. They had took their nap and all of a sudden these three people standing there like, wait, wait, wait. Let's build y'all a house. So I pause myself. What if they saw wrong because they didn't spend that time in prayer? What if, what if when Jesus took them up on that mountain, they would have really, really spent a lot of time in prayer? They would have understood what was happening right before their eyes. But every time Jesus came back, they were asleep. And he said to them, go ahead, take your rest. Because my hour has come, right? Here's the thing. As I'm looking at this, I was last, not last, but I was at one point talking about the privilege of prayer. You see the power. You see what can happen when we pray. The Bible says that when Moses prayed, not Moses, I'm sorry, when Elijah prayed for rain, it's when he prayed that it stopped raining and stopped. When she prayed for a child, she had Solomon. Whenever Elijah prayed, he saw the hand of God. Whenever Paul prayed, he went into a trance and he saw this sheet come down four corners, different beasts on each corner. And he understood as God was telling him to eat, he kept saying, I've never eaten anything that was bad. I'm not going to eat that, right? But in that, God was showing him that God was going to save the life of this whole family. I'm not going to call them common. I'm going to call them good. No longer call them bad. I am going to save the Gentiles. So as I was looking, I fell upon this scripture in Revelation. And I was so, like literally, y'all, I promise you, I I like felt myself waking up in the middle of the night just crying over this scripture. Crying because of what happens when we pray. So I take you to Revelations. We're going to look at verse 4 right quick. Try to make this chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to try to make this quick, okay? It says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. So here you have John praying. And he says, and after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. What? You mean to tell me when we pray, we should be able to see doors open in heaven? Just food for thought. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither. And I will show these things which must be hereafter. God wants to show us things that must be hereafter. But the only way that you can get there is through prayer, right? That was 4 1. And I want to show with you, show you another scripture that says. Hold on. I'm going to go to chapter 8 in Revelations, and I'm at verse 1 through 4. And it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. 
And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the Lord. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the, with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. I never knew that when I prayed, it was like a sweet smell of fragrance to God. It's like a sweet smelling fragrance. And then I'm like, well, how does it become this sweet smelling fragrance? Because when we come before God and we're praying, I really believe with all of my heart that God intends for us to do what to do to have done what happened with the face of Moses, what happened with Paul, what happened with John, that we see in the spirit because as we pray, we become more spiritual than we are earthly. I know that's, that's kind of a hard one, right? But when they prayed, they didn't become the, they didn't stay the same when they really effectually fervently prayed their visage changed i'll tell you the story some years ago i went on a fast right it was like my first ever single fast like i had fasted with the church on some time but for some reason I don't even know the reason why at this point I felt like the Lord was laying me to fast and I did. And I fasted for 11 days and I just did water for 11 days. After the fast, I, I, I really don't want you to really see the fast, but I, after the fast, what happened? The day that I broke my fast, my intent was to go 15 days and I broke it. I'm honest, to tell the truth, shame bill. But I got to 11 and day 11, I was at work and somebody came to my job and said, um, I'm having this baby shower for my child and I have invited a lot of people. Will you please come? Because no, everybody is backing out last minute. And I was like, uh, ooh, got to see work, but I'll try my best. I get it. So I did. So I left from my job because I hadn't, didn't even know I was invited to a baby shower, so I didn't have anything. So I go to the store to go buy stuff. And when I go to the store to buy stuff, all of a sudden this homeless man, I think, walks up to me. And he says to me, can I, can I give him money? Like, <laughs> you would have to know me to know. I'll be like, Lord, gee, please help me. Because I don't know whether they're telling me the truth or telling me a lie. They're just trying to get my money. Like, like they're trying to set me up. Like, Lord, you got to help me. So when he came up to me, I was not prepared for the words that was going to come out of my mouth. The words that came out of my mouth was like, no, you ain't going to do nothing but take my money and go get you something to drink. You coming up here telling me lies. No, I'm not giving you my money. But it wasn't what I said. Is what happened next? He said, "Yes." He said, "Okay, okay, okay, okay. I get it. I get it. I get it. You're right. You're right. I get it." And I'm standing in the parking lot of the store with this man screaming to the top of his lungs. I get it. I get it. I get it. But what he said next floored me. He said, "Oh my gosh!" Now this man is in. I I was not dressed in no turtleneck and no skirt all the way down to my. I was coming from work. I probably had on um some of my khakis and ten shoes. But when I said that, he looked at me and said, I see him. And I'm like, I promise you, I looked around like, who <laughs> do you see? And he said, I see Jesus all over you. I was a little young in my walk. And so I, I was embarrassed, to say the least, because he was screaming. It. He said, I see him. I see him. And he was backing up. He was like, I see him. He all over you. And I'm like, Jesus, if you want him to get in this store right quick. And then I came home and Joyce Myers was on TV. And I don't I don't necessarily have certain televangelists or TV preachers that I'd like follow, follow, follow. Like, so for her to pop on that day and say what she said, I knew it was from the Lord because I hadn't been just like, okay, she's my baby. Let me look her up. Let me see what she's saying about things. So I come home and the TV was on and she said, whenever you fast, your uh, demeanor, like your physical appearance change people can see him through you this is what happened for Moses 
Moses was in the light of God. So much so that when he came out of that light, that light still shone upon him. I think that whenever we think about the purpose, when we ever we think about the power and the privilege of prayer, the power of prayer is this supposed to change us and make us more into the image. He's now trying to take that dust that he started with, that dust that he created humanity with, and he had already given us. He breathed in our nostrils and gave us life, but he wants to give us himself. He wants to give us his spirit so that his spirit so shines within us that when we come out and spend a time with him, people don't see us no more. They see him. I don't think God has a problem with giving me a job, a house, a car. Da, da, da. He said he would give me the desires of my heart. But I think his ultimate desire is that he would have kids that really reflect him in the earth. reflect him in the earth. So the purpose of prayer, and the power of prayer, and the privilege, it's a privilege that God has given all of us to be able to come into his presence. The Bible says, what's that scripture, Holy Spirit? Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted his soul into vanity. People, like, let's understand, let's get it. Our righteousness is not our righteousness. It's not the matter of the amount of times I pray, or the matter of time, or the amount of times that I fast, or it's not a, that I've read the Bible more than you. No, no, no. Because the Bible says that our righteousness is as a filthy rag. It's as filthy rags to God. So no matter of steps that you make in the right direction makes you holy. It's His Son Jesus Christ. In us, the hope of glory, the hope of glory, his son in us. So the more his son, the more he looks at us and sees his son, the more we are righteous. When he looks at us, if he don't see his son, we don't see righteousness. Everything else is like a filthy rag to him. But when he looks at us and we reflect his son, Jesus, he see righteousness. The more he looks at us and he sees his spirit, the Holy Spirit working in and through us, we're righteous before him. And now we can ascend to the hill of the Lord because our hands has been cleansed with fuller soap, fuller soap by the blood of Jesus Christ. So now when we come boldly before the throne, he's not asking me, he's not asking you, he's not asking us to ask for frivolous stuff. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. I know you have needed those things. But he said, if you ask me for my spirit, I wouldn't deny it to you. Why? I'm going to say this last thought. Yesterday, my daughter had to go to out of state, I'm mean, out of state, out of town to go take a test. And on the way, we, we went to Raleigh, right? And on the way, me and my daughters was like, me and my, me and my baby daughter, my oldest daughter, were talking, having a conversation. My baby was in the back, but my oldest daughter, her and I were having a conversation. She was like, well, pull up GPS because we know we got to go to this site, but we don't know where it's at. So I'm like, okay. I said, oh, shoot, I don't even know how to tell her. I ain't got no power because I am the one that normally leaves out of the house with the block at the house and didn't charge my phone. So I'm like, I can't tell her because she's going to be like, mom, yeah. So I tell her, I, 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 um, did you did you charge your phone? And she say, no, I ain't got the 30 some percent. Oh, I was in the clear then. I'm like, girl, I got the 38. <laughs> That's it. But here's, here's the thing. I have 38 percent on my phone. I have 38 percent on my phone. But in the car, I have the charger cable with me. So I'm good. I even brought the extra block. I and fabulous. I got this thing made in shape. And I get ready to plug in the cigarette lighter. Right? This ain't the phone that's go with, so it ain't gonna plug in. <laughs> I got ready to plug this into the cigarette lighter and I noticed something. My phone has the capability to send any kind of picture, any kind of text, voicemails, video messages. Um, let me do, you know, pay bills on it. You, you know, all that privilege we got on our phone. But when I went to plug into the cigarette lighter, 
it didn't fit. I was like, oh, okay. So I had to tell my daughter, I was like, uh, I'm going to plug, I, I put in the GPS, but it's losing power just as soon as I plug it in. It's going really rapidly because we got these maps open and trying to find where we're going. And so by the time we get there, our, both of our phones is like literally almost dead. But they're powerful. And though we have a car that has sufficient power to charge this phone, I have a cord that will connect it. I couldn't plug in. So I got the power. I got the capability. I got the power source. And I still can't charge up my phone. So what am I good for? Nothing. We have the power source. God Almighty is the power source. The plug is Jesus Christ. The electricity running through is the Holy Spirit. But if you and I cannot plug in, we're useless to God. God wants us to have the power so that we can use our privilege to change the world. Not just change our houses, our dresses, our bank accounts. That's not what he wants. He wants us to change the world. And when I think about Moses coming down off that mountain and his face shined, he showed them people a real God that was up there on that mountain. And when I think about Paul, as he was standing there in the trance and the sheet came down, he showed Cornelius and them a real God that can hear your prayer and answer because you was praying over there. You were not even privy to be in the number. You wasn't an Israelite. You wasn't a Jew. But because you was praying, God sends a message to a man over there waiting for the chitlins to get finished, waiting for the fried chicken to get fried, waiting for the baked ham to come out. But God intercepts that insect. Go to this Gentile. Because today, I'm going to change his life. When is the last time we prayed that we really saw the hand of God turn the world around? That's what the disciples experienced. Now, don't get me wrong. They weren't perfect because remember, they went to school. But I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying now, we got to wake up. We got to wake up. So the place that God wants to take us in, we got to wake up. I could keep going, but I I believe you got the gist, the power, and the privilege of prayer. Thank you, April. Thank you, Pastor Jackson, for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you, Jerusalem. New Jeru is it? No, Jerusalem. I apologize. Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church. Thank you for allowing me to share of what God had given me on the purpose. No, it's not the purpose, but the power and privilege. I always want to say purpose because we always, the purpose driven is the purpose, purpose. The power and privilege of prayer. Thank you for allowing me to share with you. Now, before I close, I just want to pray. Father, our Father which are in heaven. Oh, I didn't tell you. So as I'm saying this, I can hear this. Okay, let me say this. When we get to the end part, don't say on. Oh. God wants to do stuff in the earth. Remember, we are the dust. He created us from the dust of the earth. God wants to shake up some things in us. So don't tell him about what on the earth needs. Tell him about what in the earth is lacking to be more like him. Our Father, which are in heaven. Hallow be thy name. That kingdom come, that will be done in earth, in me, as it is in heaven. Father, cause our face to shine as we spend more and more time with you. Let us be like Jesus was when he walked the streets and he walked up to them and he, he began to expound on scriptures and the people were like, didn't your heart just burn within you? Let us, when we talk, of you, your miracles, your 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 statues, your commandments, your love for us. Let the people's heart burn, Lord God. 
Let them feel your presence. Let them feel that you are real, Father. That you care for them. You care for us. That you love us so much so that you gave your only begotten son for us. Let their hearts burn within them, Lord. As we share of the word of God, as we share of the blessing to of the blessing of God to be called into the number of the blessing to have our names written in the Lamb's book of life. Let their heart burn, not burn against you, Lord, but burn for you. Give them a hunger and thirst at the righteousness, Lord, because at that point you said we should be filled. And it's in Jesus name I pray. Amen and amen.